I'm Steve Weberg. I'm with the public affairs staff of the Kansas City Public Library. On behalf of our interim director, Debbie Siragusa, and Carrie Coogan, our deputy director for public affairs and community engagement, I, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, many of you I, I know are old friends, um, regulars of our signature programming, and it's, and it's great to reconnect with you, even, even in a virtual sense. And while it's not unusual for our live streamed programs to draw viewers from across the country, I, I know our audience tonight is, is especially wide. And I wanna welcome those of you who are joining us from Houston and elsewhere in Texas, from New York and Washington, DC, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Louisville, Denver, and Martinsburg, Missouri. Um, and a little bit more about Martinsburg in just a second. Um, one quick plug um, as, we, uh, as we get into this, um, I really couldn't be prouder of our library and, and of libraries across the country right now and how they're meeting the challenge of this health crisis and the social distancing that it has necessitated. Um, we're providing, and, and in many cases, expanding access to, to countless online resources, books, magazines, movies, TV shows, music, and, and an array of valuable learning resources. We're continuing uh, outreach through uh, children's story times and other programs. We've, we've bumped up the Wi-Fi signals at each of our locations, making it available to the public in parking lots and other adjacent areas. And we're in week two now of taking the library's nationally renowned signature programming online. I'm confident that many of you with us tonight were, were with us last June when Jean Becker spoke at our downtown Central Library about the eventful and productive post-presidency of George H.W. Bush. Uh, Jean was warm, she was funny, she was as masterful and entertaining a storyteller as we've ever had at the library. In short, she was a hit. We had close to 200 people for that event, and I can't tell you how many of them asked me on their way out when she'd be back. Uh, in an email yesterday, I gave uh, the Bush family members who are joining us here a, a heads up. She set the bar very high. Um, also, for those who may not know, Gene and I have a history. Not that kind of history, but we grew up together. Uh, me in a little farm town in East Central Missouri, Martinsburg. Uh, she on a farm outside of town. We went to the same high school, both went to the University of Missouri, both went into journalism, worked together at what essentially was our hometown newspaper, the Mexico Ledger, and later at USA Today. Then Jean got famous and so much for the parallel track. Uh, Jean worked news side for USA Today, I worked in sports. She covered the uh, 1988 election uh, in which George Bush defeated Michael Dukakis and impressed Barbara Bush enough to be offered a job for the next four years as the First Lady's Deputy Press Secretary. After the Bushes left the White House, uh, Jean served 25 years as the former president's chief of staff. Tonight, she's going to help us get to know Barbara just a little better. Barbara Bush, wasn't merely one of the most popular first ladies in our nation's history. I, I don't think it's overstatement to say she was a treasure. She was warm and she was natural. She had no pretensions. And she spoke her mind candidly, very refreshingly. And speaking her mind is what her book, Pearls of Wisdom, Little Pieces of Advice That Go a Long Way is all about. And I say her book because Jean will tell you that's what it is, Barbara's book. Barbara's words, Barbara's advice and admonishments over the years to family, to friends, to, to everybody in her orbit. Jean's pulled them together in Pearls of Wisdom, but she's also connected them very artfully with anecdotes and valuable insights into a very remarkable woman. I know how fortunate Jean feels to have been such a close part of the Bush's lives for, for 30 years. And I think I know how blessed the president and Mrs. Bush felt to have had her at their side for so long. It says everything that Jean was one of the handful of people in the room when President Bush died in November of 2018. And she was with Barbara Bush the night before she died, two years ago last Friday. 
Jean has brought some special guests tonight with her. Uh, I'll let her introduce them. We're enormously, enormously grateful to them as well for taking the time to be with us. If you have a question over the course of the evening, we invite you to submit it via the YouTube live chat box and we'll get as many answered as we can at the end of the discussion. Again, thank all of you so much for being a part of this special evening. And Jean, my friend, welcome back, kind of, to Kansas City. Thank you very much, Steve. I guess it takes someone from your hometown to give that introduction. Wow, that was a great introduction. Thank you so much. And I was really sad when I couldn't come to Kansas City last month, which I was supposed to do, and of course it got canceled. So I'm very grateful to you and the Kansas City Public Library for hosting this webinar tonight so we could still talk about pearls of wisdom. And here's the good news. If I came to Kansas City, it was gonna be just me. Tonight, because we're doing this by Zoom and by YouTube, I, three very special guests have agreed to join us. That would be Neil Bush, President and Mrs. Bush's third son, and two of their granddaughters, and Neil's two daughters, Lauren Bush Lauren and Ashley Bush. I'm going to let them introduce themselves in just a few minutes. I will tell you that Ashley and Lauren are absolutely my favorite grandchildren. <laughs> and if any of the other grandchildren happen to have zoomed in on this, well, you know what? The truth hurts. I'm you know, <laughs> sorry, guys, but that's sort of what happens. Thanks, Jean. Um, yeah, it's true. Okay, before we get on with the program, um, just for fun, we did this the last time. Since everybody's at home and it's sort of the happy hour or the dinner hour, depending on where you are in the country, we are going to play, we want to invite you to play along with us. We're going to play a drinking game. Every time, no, nobody has to drive home, so I'm not encouraging dangerous behavior here. So every time you hear two words, it's really three words, I invite you to take a sip, not a swig, a sip of your drink. Now, the last webinar that Neil was part of, we chose the words mom and Ganny. Well, 20 minutes into the program, everybody was out of a drink and it, it got ugly. So we can't do mom and Ganny tonight. So we're going to do Kansas City and we're going to do Missouri. And just to get you started, I want you to know everyone there in Kansas City, Missouri, okay, you ready? And yes, I'm shameless, my Missouri Tiger Cup. Um, I did root for the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl, of course, since I am from the great state of Missouri. And uh, yes, you can have another sip of your drink. Even when the Chiefs played the Houston Texans, it's possibly that I rooted for the Chiefs. I really can't say that. Neil's already shaking his head. I know I have several friends on from Houston. We'll talk later about that. Uh, I also want to make the point that I also know that Kansas City is in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so now that, now that you all have had a couple of good drinks, let's go on, go on with the program. A lot of people have asked me how Mrs. Bush managed to write a book uh, a year after she died. Here it is. This book came out about a year after she died. And my answer is... She wrote, she spent her whole life writing this book because as Neil and Lauren and Ashley know, she spent her whole life giving her family and friends and staff advice. She was the best advice giver we ever knew. It will be her voice that you will hear and read in these pages. And it's going to be her voice that you're gonna hear right now. We have a video that we like to share with you now. promise we have a video. <laughs> Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> Lauren, that was brilliant. I'll drink for my Kansas City, Missouri cup. Oh, you're making us drink? <laughs> Lauren's drinking water. It's not Because Lauren, Lauren said Kansas City, Missouri. Well, that's just Still good. Still in time. <laughs> a little technical glitch here. Give me just a second. I'm going to get the video queued up. Do you want us to keep talking or... <laughs> yes, go ahead and have a conversation amongst yourself and then suddenly okay. this is going to go away and you'll see the video pop up. 
Okay, what I'm going to do while we're waiting for the video, I was going to read this after the video, and before I turned it over to Neil and Lauren and Ashley, um, just a very short reading from the book, what Mrs. Bush used to tell her audiences, she knew she was bossy. She was a self-admitted bossy person, and this is what she used to say about that. Now, I can't give you any advice on how to be a good teacher or a writer or a scientist or an actor or a dancer. I especially can't give you advice on dancing. But at this point in my life, I can share with you some ideas on how to survive the inevitable ups and downs. After all, in 80 years of living, I have survived six children, 17 grandchildren, six wars, a book by Kitty Kelly, two presidents, two governors, big election day wins and big election day losses and 61 years of marriage to a husband who keeps jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. So it's just possible along the way I've learned a thing or two. <laughs> oh, video. One night, I absolutely couldn't sleep and found myself thinking about what I've learned in life, sometimes the hard way. Try to find the good in people and not the bad. Isn't it better to make a friend than an enemy? Do not buy what you cannot afford. Don't try to live up to your neighbors and be sure you pay people back. Value your friends and remember that loyalty is a two-way street. Love your children. Don't worry that your children never listen to you. Worry that they're always watching you. Those human connections with spouses, with children, with friends are the most important investment you will ever make. You really shouldn't take yourself or life too seriously. Someone once said there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those that wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord. And there are others who wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning. Make sure you're the former and not the latter. None of us are the same. None of us are perfect, but it's our cracks and flaws that make our lives together so very interesting. Fathers and mothers, if you have children, they must come first. You must read to your children, and you must hug your children, and you must love your children. Your success as a family, our success as a society, depends not on what happens in the White House, but on what happens inside your house. Somewhere out in this audience may even be someone who will one day follow in my footsteps and preside over the White House as the president's spouse, and I wish him well. I still believe that if more people could read, write, and comprehend, we could solve so many of our problems. The parents we've met are determined to teach their children integrity, strength, responsibility, courage, sharing, love of God, and pride in being an American. Remember, at the end of your life, you will never regret not having passed one more test, not winning one more verdict, or closing one more deal. You will regret time not spent with a spouse, a child, a parent, or a friend. No matter what our problems, we can always find people who are worse off than we are. Help them and forget self. And above all, seek God. There is absolutely no downside. I'm now going to, I know that a great video. Uh, Neil, I want you to take it away. Thank you very much, Jean. Um, I guess before reading from this amazing book, <laughs> Barbara Bush, Pearls of Wisdom, uh, I think it'd be appropriate to recognize that these are, are really crazy times. And um, I know that on behalf of the entire Bush family, uh, that we hope that everyone in Kansas City, oh, I didn't say the whole word <laughs> in the great city that we're speaking to and, and all for all of those that are 
tuning in from elsewhere, that you're doing well, that your loved ones are doing well. Um, a lot of people, you know, are going through a very difficult time. And so uh, just, just no, I'm sorry, I'm a little teary. I, um, just know that we're thinking of, of all of those that are troubled during these difficult times. Uh, we're praying for those that are going through these difficult times. We have a great country. We have people in this country that care deeply about others and we will get through it and, and, and we will be better off for it. I know it's hard to imagine that happening at this moment, uh, but so, so I just want to acknowledge that, um, that, we, that we hope everyone's well. So having said that, I'd like to acknowledge that I've never had a beard in my life. Uh, the silver <laughs> fox, <laughs> and now it's the first time ever. My daughters who are joining tonight didn't recognize me. My, my wife looked at me today at the breakfast table and said, who is that? Who are you? <laughs> I, told me you look. I know you see gray a little bit now. It's you great. Well, so I gray to say that my mom was no, known as the silver fox. This is a this is one of my favorite pictures of mom. But if you turn it upside down, <laughs> you kind of, you, you know, this is the, I've got the silver fox <laughs> gave birth to the silver beard. So, anyway, so uh, thanks everybody for joining. Mom and Dad, I know loved people in Kansas City. I'm sorry I said it again. They, they, then the people tuning in today yep. gave them great Ooh. joy. So everybody, I'll take one quick sip. I'm gonna read from the. Um, uh, I'm going to read from the my my contribution. So Jean asks everybody in our family, siblings and grandchildren, and many staff members to contribute to Pearls of Wisdom. What did you learn from Barbara Bush? This piece was written five years ago at the republication of of her book, and so this is a little aged, but it still still is it are are my reflections of what I learned from my mother. It has been a joy to share America's mother with a nation that loves Barbara Bush. Mom's 70 year devoted marriage, her public affection and support for her children and grandchildren, her sharp humor, her naturally elegant pearl accented style and silver head of hair have endeared her to millions. On a very personal basis as a son, mom has taught me to be a better parent, a better person and a better citizen. She's taught me to be a better parent by demonstrating the importance of unconditional love. I struggled with reading in elementary and middle school. Mom felt my pain and worked hard to find a diagnosis and solution. She stood by me, lifted my spirits, helped me find joy in things I did well, and made sure my life wasn't mired in self-doubt. There has never been a question about my mother's commitment to my health and well-being. She is a Neil Bush warrior. And I've learned to be a. Mm -hmm. Okay, why, why Neil? Well, Neil yeah, takes a deep I breath. Just, I I, let me just explain the that the Bush family. family she's a he, he, he and his daughter, he and his sister Doro, are chairman of the ball committee. They're very I'm emotional. Sure. They cry. It's one of the things I love about them that they can't, that they <laughs> cry. So we. Thank Neil, you for that you answer. Got this. That helped. Thank you. All right. <laughs> She's a Neil Bush warrior, and I've learned to be a devoted and loving parent from her. Mom has taught me to be a better person by demonstrating core values that ground good behavior, lead to wise, wise choices, and make life a whole lot better. Under her early leadership, I learned to make my bed, to hang up used towels, and to use a bank account. She prepared me for living independently. Mom has taught me, has also taught me to endure hardships. Mom had endured an indescribable back pain, rarely complaining. She doesn't burden other people with her, her with tales of her woes. After double knee replacement and heart valve surgery, she recovered quickly, demonstrating the amazing willpower. I've, I've learned from her to power through pain, to endure jet lag, to bounce up after a fall, and to get back into the game. She taught us to be kind and respectful of others, to say thank you, and to be polite. She praises hard work and good deeds. And mom as the gatekeeper for grounding her large flock of children and grandchildren. There are no inflated egos or feelings of entitlement in the Bush family. She advocates transparency and owning up to things. Oftentimes it has to do with spending money. As a young couple with a bunch of kids, mom and dad didn't spend money on exotic family trips. They always preferred to save. Mom fiercely advocates frugality and living a debt-free lifestyle. 
Also, I've learned that there's no point in hiding stuff. She will find out about the ski vacation in Colorado or beach trip to the Bahamas. <laughs> I married a woman who shares mom's aversion to debt. So at the age of 60, five years ago, I'm on the right track. Truthfully, I'm still working to incorporate into my life some of the things that mom has emphasized. And finally, I am a better citizen because I've seen mom's active commitment to helping others throughout her life. Before she had the first lady's platform where her charitable works received lots of attentions, mom would selflessly volunteer in hospitals and schools and in the communities where she lived. It's no wonder that service became a part of the Bush family culture. And now I serve as chairman of Points of Light, the largest organization in the world focused on volunteerism. What ignites my passion more than anything is the work we are doing in Houston through the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. It is a blessing to have a strong, stable, loving, witty mother in my life. She fills my heart with joy and blankets me with unconditional love and support. If every family were led by a Barbara Bush, the world would be a much better place. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a great piece, Neil. Beautiful. I Thanks. love that. Okay, up next. Yeah, did you oh. write that when Ganny was still alive? What's that? that yeah. I wrote that when she was still alive. All of us wrote something like that. It was actually, it's in the book. You got to go by the I, book. <laughs> I thought it was post. Um, I believe I wrote mine after she. Oh, you were, at, you were invited to write yours post, you right? Did. Oh, okay. I'm like, yeah. wait. But what Neil and Marvin and Neil and his, his brothers and his sister, they wrote something about five years ago. Okay. And I got it for her 90th birthday. And I got permission. It was, they were just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So got permission to republish them in this book but all the grandkids what you wrote was just for this book and so lauren we're going to turn it over to you and first of all i just want you to tell everybody just a little bit about yourself where you live and what you do and then talk about your ganny sure well i don't live in kansas city missouri Oh, but I, <laughs> break on purpose it's making it more exciting for folks at home i'm sure um, I live in New York City. I um, am daughter to Neil, sister to Ashley. Mm -hmm. um, I run a company called Feed. We're a social business with a mission to uh, create good products and really rally funds and awareness around the issue of hunger. So I've been at that for about 13 years, hard to believe. Um, and now I have a husband and two little boys, James and Max. Um, and Max actually was born just two days right before Ganny passed. So unfortunately never met Ganny, but I feel like has maybe some of her grit and spirit in him, um, if you believe in past lives, et cetera. And yeah, James, who definitely spent a lot of, um, a bit of time with her in Houston. Uh, he, she lived across the street from my dad. So whenever we would go back to Houston to see him, we would get to see Ganny and Gampy, of course, um, but very missed. And yeah, really, Jean, love that you compiled this, not only for the world, but I would say for us as like a way to, you know, treasure her. And her voice was just so resounding in my childhood and not just childhood, adulthood too. Um, and I feel like it's, she's one of those people where that voice, that inner voice is still there. Um, sort of like, what would Ganny say in this situation? She always had an opinion. Um, so thank you for chronicling it and asking all of like the people closest to her to reflect on that. I think it's anyway, a nice gift I'll pass along one day to my kids too. So I will read my bit, page 25, for those who have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My Ganny, Barbara Bush, was a strong matriarch whose, who, whose pearls of wisdom were offered to all who knew her, but especially her grandkids, regularly and without hesitation. These candid truths were at times jarring, but always instructive and meant to make us the best versions of ourselves. Here are a few that are forever etched in my memory, thanks to Ganny. Don't say um, yeah, or like. Hence, speak clearly and precisely. The unfortunate thing about this advice is that the more you are told not to say something, the more ingrained the words become. <laughs> Secondly, be patient. Ganny loved to garden in Maine. Once I was walking by and I picked a bud from her garden without thinking and was caught red-handed. Needless to say, Ganny was not happy. 
<laughs> he marched over. She marched me over to a beautiful flower in full bloom and told me that this is what the bud could have become. She loved to plant seeds and watch them grow to their full beauty. Even now that she is gone, her garden in Maine is magnificent thanks to her tender and patient care year after year. Thirdly, stay current. My grandmother was one of the first people I knew to get a Blackberry and then a Kindle and then an iPhone and eventually an Instagram account featuring her beloved BB and Minnie as her profile picture. In one summer when the Fitbit trend was at its height and she was well into her late eighties and not walking as much as she once did, she would wear it around her ankle to get extra st steps when she rode her giant adult tricycle around the point in Maine. And lastly, be loyal. My Ganny was loyal to my grandfather until the end. As they both got older, she would often say that she wanted to live one day longer than our Gampy. She wanted to be there for him, and when he was gone, she would be ready to go. The loyalty to her husband and her family clearly brought her so much joy and purpose in life. This unwavering loyalty made her at times a force to be reckoned with, but also my greatest champion. And that's it. Thank you. Hey. I love that. Um, <laughs> Ashley, we're going to hand the baton off to you. Tell us first about yourself and then what you learned from your Ganny. As Lauren was talking, I could feel Ganny's like hand push up. <laughs> <laughs> up straight. You're right. You're right. You'd just be sitting there at lunch and you just feel a poke on your mind. <laughs> but it comes very much in handy. You got to own the room, own the spot, you know? So anyway, uh, I, my name is Ashley and I live in sunny LA. As you can see, it's 430 or five o'clock here. Um, and I'm a filmmaker, mainly in TV writing and then doc producing a couple of documentaries. And yeah, I can't, I'm so excited to share this moment with my dad and my sister and Jean and talk about Ganny. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like it's been two years and, you know, like Lauren said, she, her voice is never goes away. You know, it's always, always there. Um, more than anyone I know, I think she's kind of stuck around past life. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's just so fun to share this moment together. So mm -hmm. I will read from my Kindle <laughs> on page 30, according to the Kindle. <laughs> <laughs> when I was little, I thought I was going to be the next Madonna. Unfortunately, I was born tone deaf and have to wear hearing aids in both ears. My grandmother knew I loved singing and never wanted me to feel different because of this. She'd pack a room full of adults, some very generous donors, who would all have to sit there and smile and applaud while I sang a very out of tune version of Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World. <laughs> it was a small moment, but it made me feel normal and it gave me the confidence to be whoever I wanted to be. But Ganny treated everyone as a normal person and she expected to be treated the same way too. Even in her old age, she refused any sort of help, any sort of special privilege. And regardless of how busy she was, Ganny always knew the smallest details of what was going on with her kids and grandkids, which cousin was where and when, and even what book they were reading. She loved gossip. So, <laughs> so, so much, I gotta get this right. Okay, let's start over. And she loved gossip. So much so that she told me about my engagement before my fiance did. <laughs> that was with my dad and Ganny, and Ganny just blurted it out. That I gotta say yes. Oh no. <laughs> After she passed away, I was wandering around the more private rooms of her house, places you might expect to find campaign memorabilia or fancy possessions, but instead there was nothing but these huge handmade collages she had put together of her family. Some photos were faded with age, others were freshly printed. Photos of my cousins and me growing up, her kids, my dad and his siblings, her and Gampy on their wedding day, and her newest great grandkids. No matter how extraordinary the events of her life were, she was always focused on the people around her. Whether it was launching a program to get millions of people reading or arranging an impromptu concert for a little girl with hearing problems, she was dedicated her life to the people around her. And Ganny's words, cherish your human connections, your relationships with your family and friends. 
Mm -hmm. Very good. <laughs> right, so Lauren, Lauren and Ashley had these beautiful, touching um, little essays they wrote about their Ganny. So I feel a little guilty about reading this. I'm sure when she wrote this, she was not talking about the two of you, maybe your brother Pierce and a couple others. But this is this is some advice she gave to an audience one time. It was an audience of women who were about her same age. And she had just survived the summer in Kennebunkport with a bunch of grandkids. And this is the advice she gave in case teenage children come to stay with you and visit you. Be careful of criticizing their clothes. What mm -hmm. they change into could be tighter and shorter than what you made them take off. <laughs> if you have a lot of tension and you get a headache, do what it says on the aspirin bottle. Take two aspirin and stay away from kids. You can't hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. That would be funny if I were talking about a grandchild, because we all know that your gampy hated broccoli. Don't lend your card to anyone you gave birth to or their offspring. <laughs> and last but not least, if you can remain calm, you don't have all the facts. So my question, girls, is did you ever get in big trouble with your Ganny? Does any of this sound familiar? Did you inspire any of those points? Oh, definitely. Lauren, you seem to have a moment if you want to start, but I can. Well, you start. <laughs> well, <laughs> I've been seared into memory, which perhaps as I talk about it, it's not as huge of a deal, but as a little squirt, as Gampy would say, um, I, it made a huge impact. And I was like shaking in my, my boots for a long time. My friend Gracie Winters, my childhood best friend and I were in Maine and we both had these matching gigantic glasses and we found a perfect moment to enter into Ganny's kitchen. And she has this love, she had this great cookie jar that was always filled with, with um, lots of cookies. And we found the perfect moment to go steal one. Um, there was no one, in, no one around. Anyway, like we 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 dip our hands and get a few, and then we hear G Ganny like just appeared at the door, and <laughs> literally yelled at us about grabbing cookies. And it's really not a huge deal, but I just remember shaking all the way home. I probably <laughs> cried because I ate cookies. I just <laughs> it was such a big mo moment to me for some yeah. reason. And then I broke the garden pot shortly thereafter so it just wasn't a great day for me <laughs> that, that was a tough day gosh but she her lesson was you don't want to have cookies and you won't be hungry for dinner she really <laughs> didn't mean to you know make it such a big deal so I think often because like she felt the need to corral so many of us she yeah. would blow somewhat out of proportion smaller things <laughs> because like she was dealing with like 20 of those smaller things. But to us as little people, you were like, wait, this seems like an overreaction. <laughs> you know, like the time I picked a flower bud, I'll never forget. Like she was so angry. Um, and it was just a little bud. And I was like, you know, innocently curious, but to her, it was like a beautiful flower in the making that I had thwarted. Um, I definitely know the car borrowing comment was about Pierce, our brother. Yeah, the car story, your your brother Pierce got into big trouble for driving her, uh, what was that, the little smart car? car. The little oh, smart, the smart car. car. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 I still remember that day. He got into big trouble. Yeah. He, I, uh, is there, you know, the, the thing that was annoying about your Ganny and her advice is she was always right. <laughs> and I mean, even when you know, there were times she gave me a lot of advice over the years and um, her, her biggest advice to me, uh, and people have heard me say this before, but your Ganny did, uh, this is a little personal, but she very kindly and gently would constantly tell me that I should probably lose some weight. She would say, for God's sakes, Jean, lose weight. So, and she was right about that. So in honor of her, I was gonna lose 80 pounds for this book tour. I was going to do the book tours, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I love that show. And I wanted to be her, the cute hats and the cute clothes. Well, as it turns out, I, I eat while I write. So that didn't work out very well. 
But here's the most important thing I learned from your Ganny. And when I, in, it, we, and several people talk about this in the book. The most important thing I learned from her is to be your own person. Mm -hmm. And she was really big on that. Don't let others define who you are. So one day when I was beating myself up for not losing 80 pounds and turning into Mrs. Maisel, it occurred to me, I finally let myself off the hook and I thought, I am not going to do the book tour as Mrs. Maisel. <laughs> I'm going to be the literary Lizzo. Lizzo. <laughs> and, I know, and I know right now across America, people are Googling who the hell is Lizzo. But when you see, <laughs> if you don't know who she is, when you see her, you will know her. You will understand why I said that. But I tell that story mainly because it just, it just, to me, that's just the embodiment of your Ganny and your mom. And I'm wondering if there's one thing that each of you would like to talk about. You did those wonderful readings, but is there anything, one thing in particular that you think, this is what I learned from mom or Ganny? Can Neil? I piggyback off of that last part of the conversation first? Um, so the stories all had kind of a negativity to it, you know, about your, <laughs> weight, about your weight and actually being chewed out in the kitchen and Lauren feeling, you know, being chewed out for picking the flowers. Um, she was, she was, she clearly had her opinions and she was pretty strong willed. She didn't mind expressing her opinions, but you know, she, she clearly had, you know, a deep love and affection for every grandchild and, and for you, Jean, and for everybody, all of her friends and for everybody. She was she was a deeply loving and caring woman. Um, so I would I, I would just th throw that in. Um, I, I will tell a story because mom's power is almost supernatural. And maybe this is a little bizarre <laughs> to tell on the you know, live YouTube streaming thing. But um, so when mom was passing away, Marie and I lived across the street and some family happened to be present the night that she was, you know, having her last last moments. Uh, we had a hospice nurse there. Uh, an hour before mom passed away, the hospice nurse had informed us that mom was, was going to be passing away shortly. And, you know, so as soon as the hospice nurse identified mom's soon, you know, um, soon to be demise or whatever, she, the power went off in the house, you know, and mom, mom was on a respirator at the time. So the power to the respirator went off. Um, and so th there's some thought that there might've been some, some super intervention there. Um, as soon as the doctor proclaimed that she had died, the power came back on. Her soul left the body and she went up to heaven and the power came back on. Um, a week later, we had the funeral in Houston and my, my sister, Dara, my beautiful sister, Dorothy came to town. She brought one black dress with her, but she went to Neiman Marcus to buy another dress. And she came home and regretted it immediately because because she said that mom would have hated that she spent so much money because mom was a tightwad, a real frugal tightwad. Um, <laughs> and, and, and the dress had a cut on the sleeve of her, of her dress. And she said mom wouldn't have liked that, that design. And so she went and put the dress on. And she was in the room where mom had passed away. There was a mirror in that room. They had lived in that house for... Um, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 years, I guess, since retiring from Washington, the mirror fell off the wall as Dara was looking at herself in this thing. She literally, the mirror fell off and broke into pieces. So Dara, my sister took the dress back, but every time we see a Robin, we think it's mom. We ever, you know, she's present. She's, you know, we feel, I think about her all the time. I know grandkids think about her all the time. She's a presence in our life. And it's a positive thing. We get a little nervous about where we were reprimanded back in the old days. <laughs> By the way, I was one final point. I'm sorry I'm dominating, but because I was the dyslectic kid and struggled, I think she was so much kinder to me than to other <laughs> other kids. You know what I mean? And I think she she drew was drawn to me. I would further observe that because dad was so kind and nice and thoughtful and never the disciplinarian, you know, you didn't want to. Um, do wrong by him because you didn't want to disappoint him but but mom had to be the bad guy because dad was so saintly and so kind and so generous to everybody you know and I don't know I feel like mom became the enforcer in part to fill the void that dad didn't fill mm -hmm. that's theory make a good point she only she only gave you the devil if she loved you 
That's a good you know, one too. Really yeah, exactly. It was always out of line. I took it as a badge of honor when I when I got my boots shaking a little bit, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a rite of passage in the Bush family. Yeah. Girls, what is the one thing you feel your Ganny left you in your heart? You Did go? you say Lauren or at girls? Girls. Both of you. Oh, girls. Okay. Well, my husband and I had, when she was in her final week, um, or I guess final few months, we went to visit her in the hospital. And oof, anyway, oh, we had like a really lovely, um, just she chatted, we, you know, she really opened up and chatted and um, gossiped about her life. We didn't want to gossip about ours. We just wanted to hear about her life. And I think the biggest thing that really stood out that she would say a few times was just how thankful she was, you know? Like mm. she's so grateful for the life that she had for for the husband that she had um and all that you know the life that they created together and that really stuck out to Jules and I as a about to become married couple that you kind of can give that to each other or you know that she really was just very thankful and she woke up as she said in that speech in the beginning of the video very thankful for mm. what she had good uh, point very good point beautiful I love that Lauren? Um, yeah, I think it was her strength. I mean, to, to be, I think since her passing even, um, I don't know, I just have more of an appreciation even than I did when she was alive, which maybe is how it always works, unfortunately. Just the things she lived through, the fact that she lost a child, that you could even come back from that and do so again, with strength and keeping your priorities straight and not sort of, you know, living in self pity and sadness um, is just awesome. And to be a woman too, in her generation and to have such a voice is just amazing. I mean, it's amazing for women now, but especially um, the time she came from. And I could always tell she was, and she would say, you know, when I, worked and, you know, pursued my own kind of career and life, um, beyond just having a family. She was always really proud of that. Um, I don't know. And that just, that really meant a lot to me because I just, she is by far like the smartest human I knew she could remember, you know, small oh facts. Um, never for, she never forgot anything. No, never. I hope I've inherited like at least a quarter of her brain. <laughs> One, of, one of the things, go ahead, Ashley. Oh, no, I just quickly echoing off of that. I mean, I know I, I it, it, you know, as I grow older and whatnot and, you know, eventually get gray and whatever, like, I just so admire that Gandhi <laughs> let it all fly. Like when it's, you know, especially nowadays with the age of Instagram and whatever, and you want to like it all made up and Botox, but I just am so um, admire that I have that example to look up to someone mm -hmm. who let it wasn't afraid to let it let her age show speaking mm -hmm. of her voice i'm asked a lot right now um what i think she would say about the pandemic and about what's going on right now would she have any advice for us and i i knew immediately where to look for that advice it was a series of speeches she gave after 9 11 and what she said to america after 9 11 it's amazing how her voice just resonates today. She was so practical and so smart. So I just very quickly, I know people I think have been sending in questions. Um, so I'm very quickly am going to read just a couple of things she said after 9-11, because I think they're so relevant today. She, what she said was, what I'd really like to do today is share some things that I think I've learned in life. You could call them pearls of wisdom. And now you know where I got the title mm -hmm. of the book. Mm -hmm. There's always something to be thankful for if you take the time to look for it. Unfortunately, it seems to me that especially in these uncertain times, people are always looking for the bad and never the good. But that's when it's even more important to look for the good. I'm going to skip down so we have time for questions. There are a few situations, no matter how sad or tragic, where most of us can't find something to be grateful for for friends and family, for our country, for our faith. It's such a waste of energy to dwell on the bad and not to rejoice in the good. And that, 
again, we all need that advice right now. I mean, who among us have not wallowed just a tiny little bit about staying at home and not seeing our friends and family? Uh, before we go to Q&A, if you don't have any questions, I'm gonna read a couple more points on that, but we really wanna hear your questions. Before we go to Q&A, Neil, can you just talk quickly about your mom's great passion about literacy? You're doing so much to see her dream of us being a more literate America come true. Just tell us, talk to us a little bit about literacy. Um, so for, for, you know, for most of her adult life, mom has been an, an advocate for literacy. And if you think about it, if one can't read at an age appropriate level, there's no possible way that they could realize their fullest God-given potential. Mom knew that. She made comments to the effect that if everyone in America could read, everyone in the world could read, the problems we see every day in our society would go away. And I, I believe that's really true. So mom has raised over the, the, the past 30 years plus hundreds of millions of dollars or over $100 million and given money to adult learning centers all over the United States, all 50 states. In Houston, we started the Barbara Bush Houston Literacy Foundation. We're working, you know, from birth all the way through to try to mobilize this community to be aware of the of the crisis in our community regarding literacy and and the leadership of the National Foundation um, um, is fabulous. Our local leader here, Julie Baker Fink, is great. British Robinson nationally. So. You know, we're, we're, we're blessed. This is a legacy that'll live way into the future. It's a critical need in our society. And, and I'm really proud that mom continues to inspire us in this work. She really, she really does. And by the way, all the author's proceeds from the book do go to literacy. So when you buy the book and buy hundreds of copies of the book, <laughs> you not only are, buy, don't laugh, Lauren, you not only are buying uh a book that I think will touch your heart, but you're also supporting a good cause. And on that note, Steve yeah, Weaver, do we point, have some questions? Um, but yeah, I, I think it's funny we didn't touch on that till now. Like we all just love to read and Ganny, again, being the enforcer as a kid would make us like sit there and she would watch us do our summer. <laughs> but now I'm looking at my Kindle mates. My dad is very generously added Ashley and myself <laughs> to, um, we have a group kind of ongoing book club Kindle and we're just constantly reading and talking about what we're reading. And it's mm -hmm. just one of the Love great, that. like it's the best way to end my day. Um, and it's such a fun now connection point to like fam with family. And mm -hmm. that really does stem from Guinea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Okay, Steve, does anybody have any questions for us? Yeah, uh, first I would say, Lauren, I, I know you would have taken it from your grandmother, but do you take it from Jean when she says, don't laugh, Lauren? I know, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, quite as nervous as Jean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a, a question from an audience that's a, a little bit of a twist, Jean, on, um, on the, you know, what, uh, what Barbara might say in uh, the coronavirus, coronavirus era. Um, and that is what, what might she have, what advice might she have about civility, about maintaining civility during stay at home orders, uh, civility in a broad sense, as well as civility among her family members who can't escape one another. <laughs> oh my goodness. Neil, do you want to tackle that? Um, well, of course she'd be an advocate for civility. Um, and, and I think, I don't know, I was witness to her um, growing dismay over the level of incivility that was mm -hmm. growing in our country um, as, as, as she became, you know, more aged. And then after the presidential election where Jeb was kind of beaten up, you know, she's a, she's a, as I mentioned, a fearless, unconditionally loving mama bear of a mother. So she didn't particularly like the deliverer of those, of the, of the, you know, <laughs> ridicule or whatever um, but it, but as she it, later on though interestingly when 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 we would be chiming in together complaining about the global situation and you know leadership or whatever mom finally just said you know what We're, we need to leave this in god's hands so <laughs> she became a little more aware that there's little you can do about it she preaches and lived a life that was very civil and things are gonna get better, but 
boy, it's just crazy out there now with this virus and with the, the level of terrible discourse that's been, you know, dominating the political landscape. Steve, I want the person who asked that question to buy the book and start reading on page 110. Because in, in 1991, there was something going on in America that Mrs. Bush didn't like very much. And all of her commencement speeches that year, she was first lady then, carried her main theme was the need for greater tolerance in our country. Mm. And particularly when uh, I've talked to a couple of, of, of student groups about the book, and I always send them to these passages, but let me just read one short thing she said. Uh, she was really worried about intolerance. Uh, we all should be alarmed at the rise of intolerance in our land. Such bullying is outrageous and not worthy of a great nation grounded in the values of tolerance and respect. Let us fight back against the boring politics of division and derision. That would be her advice to us today. And she would definitely be making sure that her family would be civil to each other as they're all quarantined together. <laughs> I'm sure of that. Audience question, does, does anyone know when Barbara began wearing pearls or how they became a part uh, of her persona? Um, That's a great question. This, this person, by the way, adds also a shout out to Lauren and her amazing top. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know the answer. Someone else asked me that the other day. She was wearing pearls when I met her as a newspaper reporter at USA Today. Neil, do you remember? You'd be I, the only one who would have been there for the beginning I, of the pearls. I really don't. I don't recall. I'm not really a fashion person. So no, I didn't <laughs> observe that. Lauren, do you have a... What? I don't remember when, but I remember it was like to cover... Didn't she say oh, quite, you're right. yeah, you're cover, right. to cover her, her like, neck? Yeah. She thought she needed to cover them or distract from them. Distract from them. <laughs> yeah, because I've tried pearls and it doesn't cover anything. It doesn't cover. <laughs> no, unfortunately. <laughs> it doesn't. Audience question. Never. Life in politics invites criticism. How did Barbara deal with critics? What advice? might she give to people who have to deal with criticism in public or in a professional setting? Anybody want to take that? Go for I'm, it, Dad. I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. Um, you know, when mom and dad were president and first lady, they were criticized frequently. And I don't think it really affected them, honestly, that much. And mom and dad both would tell you that when George became president or Jeb as governor, when they received public um, criticism or, you know, un, you know, when they were beaten up in the, pol the political environment, they, it, it hurt them a lot more than when it, when it happened to them. So um, I think that the advice would be, you know, you know who you are. Mom and dad were both so well grounded in their faith with friends and family. It didn't, I don't think what someone would say about them um, would hurt them at, at any level because they knew they knew exactly what they were doing, who they were, and they felt good about the values that they lived their lives by. So um, just live a good life and don't worry about what other people think. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> this is my question. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to wrap my mind around the paradox of the kind of alpha personality of the family being the wife of the president and not the president. Mm. Is it a paradox? <laughs> That's an interesting. And how, and how did that work? Okay. I, uh, you know, I don't know how Neil and Lauren and Ashley are going to feel about my saying this. And I, I said this to a group of book club women the other day, and I told them what was said on this webcast, had to stay on the webcast, and now I'm saying it on YouTube. <laughs> Here's the thing that absolutely amazed me about George Herbert Walker Bush. They, first of all, they had a great, from my viewpoint, they had a great partnership. Their marriage was just such a great partnership. And they certainly both listened to each other. But President Bush was the main spreader of the myth that Mrs. Bush wore the pants in the family. He said it in every speech. He loved to talk about it. Uh, she was the enforcer that she wore the pants in the family. And the truth is, while being his chief of staff for 25 years and observing the two of them together, he almost always got his way. 
<laughs> he had Barbara Bush wrapped around his little finger. And I mean this with all due love and respect. George Bush was one of the most Machiavellian people I knew. <laughs> and he knew he would he would come up, he would come up with an idea that she hated. And by the end of the discussion, she not only liked the idea, she was taking credit for it being her idea. Okay. And this was his MO, and I watched him do it for 25 years. Neil, am I right or wrong? I think you're, I think you're a hundred percent right. <laughs> um, I, I think, but dad got his way because he was so kind to others. He did everything leaning into it with love. And when you're feeling loved and you know, then you want to love back and you want to do well and you want to do the right thing. Um, so, so no one in, in our family wanted to cross him in any way. He didn't have to say a word. It was just the fact that, that he, you know, he had, I don't know, because of his own life and example, he, he set a very high standard or bar for how you should conduct yourself. Mom, on the other hand, had the, had the different approach. He just said, don't eat the ice cream, you know, and the thing, she put a padlock <laughs> on the freezer, that kind of thing. You know, she was make your bed, pick up the towels and those kinds of things. So, um, yeah, it was just a different style of leadership. Dad, dad clearly was an effective leader, not because he was bossy or a bully or commanding. He didn't want attention. He, in his public service, he served with humility and humbleness. And, he, and his presidency, by the way, just a quick aside, and there are probably people out there that might dispute this, his four-year pres presidency was probably the, one of the most successful four years dealing with major issues, both domestic and foreign, of any president. And, it, and it, 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 his style of leadership, his experience going into that office, you know, contributed to his, his great success. And by the way, having an amazing wife and loyal, devoted, you know, open and fresh and refreshing, incredible wife helped a lot. <laughs> they were great partners. Final question. And final okay, go question. ahead. Are we okay on time? Because we, are we okay on time? Uh, we can do one, for, one more question. I'm going to turn okay. it over to you. So these are the printable quotes from Barbara Bush. <laughs> what was the most unprintable quote? And if you can't say it, what was the story behind it? No, 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 no. You don't want to me uh, <laughs> I have one. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, uh, yeah, I am a little thirsty. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, you know, I'll flash up my Missouri Tiger, uh, <laughs> yeah. pandering to the audience. Okay. So my husband and I dated seven whole years before we got engaged. <laughs> and that just irked my grandmother to no end because, again, I think, you know, especially in her day, ac according to her, my, my Gampy was the first man she ever kissed, ever dated. Um, so the seven long years... She just could not understand. So first she, you know, would tiptoe around it very assertively, but more gently with my husband. And then finally, about year five and a half, six, she cornered, I was like, I don't know where I was. I left him alone for probably five minutes in Maine, <laughs> found him, cornered him and literally said, I don't want to cuss, but shit or get off the pot. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it this for the poor David? <laughs> Why you actually then the did propose, so you know, maybe it worked. <laughs> did he propose that that um, um no it took him like six more months, but still <laughs> the pressure, the pressure mounted. Yeah. I think oh Laura, that was a, that was a really good one. That was perfect. Right? Great. Story. Only he knew he couldn't go back to Maine six months after that without yeah. having it was a make or break. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, you guys should write a second book that the title could be "All the Things That Gene Becker Didn't Tell You in Pearls of Wisdom." Yeah. It will be a runaway bestseller. Yeah. I okay. promise you. Well, Gene, let me turn this this back to you. I think you have one more uh, video clip. We do, and I hope Neil and Lauren and Ashley can stick around. Uh, we're going to show a video, and we're running a little over time, and the video runs a little long. But particularly in this time of when everyone's struggling just a little bit to find the joy in life, I'm going to show you one of my favorite videos of President and Mrs. Bush. Um, laughter truly is the best medicine. 
And I don't know what got into them this particular day. This was 15 years ago, maybe. They were taping something for a Bob Hope special. And I hope whatever got into them that day will now get into you. And when it's over, we're gonna come back and say goodbye. Uh, Neil, Ashley, and Lauren, can you stick around? Do you need to go? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll be back after the video. So let's run the video. Um, and I'll just say Kansas City, Missouri before we go to video. Okay. <laughs> It gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, good doggy. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> you got all the lines. <laughs> Go, keep going. Bob doesn't just do jokes about the president. He teases all, we've already done this, all the occupants of the White House. Wives, kids, even pets. And when our dog Millie came out with her book, Bob started referring to me as Barbara Bush, Millie's typist. And as soon as the book became a bestseller, Bob wrote her into the act, too. He said, Millie made over a million dollars last year. It's a hell of a lot more than the president made. Come on, we got, these guys are busy. Guys. It's the same thing I just read. We had, we had they wanted to do it over again, and you hammed it up. <laughs> Okay. Okay, okay, here we go. No, I okay. Bob doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't. <laughs> this isn't funny at all. You know it. Stop it. All right. Shh. Okay. Damn it. That's funny. <laughs> all right, come on. Bob doesn't just do jokes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to ask you to leave. <laughs> Am I not in the picture? Well, you can hear you. I mean, <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's no. All right, here we go. Okay. Bob doesn't just do jokes about the president. He teases all the occupants of the White House. Wives, kids, even pets. When our dog Millie came out with her book, Bob started referring to me as Barbara Bush, Millie's typist. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, he's not getting me in there. Well, <laughs> I own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Miss this. Come on. I don't know. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got all the lines. <laughs> and one more time. All right. And action. <laughs> That's you. what you want. <laughs> okay, ready? President Bush. Good. Okay. Here we go. And action. <laughs> <laughs> What is the matter with you? <laughs> it's a comedy show. <laughs> you, want a, you want the funeral one? Yeah. Okay. And action. Very good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. I, I, you know what? I can never watch that video enough. And oh my gosh, we need laughter. So I... I just want to say thanks to Neil and Lauren and Ashley. You're the best to come join us and all the people in Kansas City and everywhere else. And Steve, I certainly want to thank the Kansas City Public Library for hosting this tonight and helping us talk about the most amazing woman we will ever know. And um, Neil, Lauren, Ashley would love to give you a chance to say goodbye. Steve, thank you very much for having us. This has been a fabulous evening. Jean, you meant so much to mom and dad, um, and, and your compilation of these stories reflecting on mom's amazing life, her words of wisdom, her pearls of wisdom, um, is a great tribute to her. And the fact that you donate the, the proceeds to the, the, the National Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy is great. So thank you. And to my amazing daughters, you're, you're amazing. My, uh -huh. <laughs> I, love, I love you both. You both are, are amazing human beings. Thanks, Dad. Lauren. 
Thank you, Jean. Thank you, um, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, no, really fun. Honestly, it has been a joy to talk about Gany and to spend this time. This is like my big social outing for the past month. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. And yeah, truly, Jean, for doing this um, for the world, but for also for our family and for the Literacy Foundations. Very generous. And um, my honor. It came from the heart. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, just echoing off, but um, well, I'm still, that video is incredible. I've never I seen it. <laughs> it's just before. incredible. That's the best. It's, it's just the best. Awesome. Were you there, Jean? I was there, and here's the thing. I don't remember how it ended up. People <laughs> keep asking me, well, what did you finally send to the Bob Hope Show? I have no idea. <laughs> All I can remember, I think they finally calmed down, but your grandparents, they were just adorable. And they, your grandfather got so tickled. This went on for, I think I finally went back to work. I think I finally said, I gotta go. <laughs> but they finally did something for the Bob Hope show. I can't remember what it was, but. Well, that was incredible. I mean, just echoing off, it's been really special. I know it's it was just my grandmother's two year anniversary of passing. So this has been a really wonderful way to commemorate her with, with my dad and Lauren and Jean. Um, yeah, so wonderful. Please buy the book. It's an incredible book. Lots of Yay, care. Ashley, thank you. So Steve, it's back to you to close out. I love you guys. Love Neil, Lauren, and Ashley. Thanks for doing this. Mr. Weedberg. I'm going to remind people that the book's on sale. You can get it most anywhere, but we're, we're pointing people to uh, bookshop.org. Um, and it's, it's an Amazon alternative, and it'll allow you to buy books from uh, independent bookstores, including, you know, many of your local independent bookstores. And uh, uh, the, the book, again, is, is Pearls of Wisdom, and I can uh, vouch for how well written it is. Um, it's hard to imagine that this event tonight would have exceeded my expectations and hopes, and you guys did. Mm -hmm. uh, you gave us just a great gift, and I can't thank you enough, Neil and Lauren and Ashley and Jean. It has been our pleasure. You guys have been terrific. And um, uh, you obviously have someone special to remember. And I'm glad that you shared those remembrances with us tonight. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, Kansas Bye. City. Good night, Good night Kansas City. <laughs> yeah.